How many of you grew up with a train around the Christmas tree? Any of you? Or at least have seen one. I see some hands being raised back there. Sure. One of the things that is so appealing, I think, about a train traveling around a tree is depending on how you set it up and where you sit, your vantage point, you can watch it come, go past you, and go away. Now, also depending on where you, how far you crank that throttle, it may come and go past you and go away rather quickly and may come right around again. But it's like you're standing at a station. Maybe you've stood at a train station, watched a train come, go to you, and then go away. That's a very realistic way to set up your train, except that a few minutes later, or a few seconds around your Christmas tree, here it comes again. But you get to relive that moment of the train coming, going past you, and going away. Now, the typical evolution of this particular species known as the model railroader begins usually around the tree and watching the train travel its circuit, but evolves into a, a person who, after the tree has come down, well, the train remains. And a quick trip down to the hardware store uh, to retrieve a sheet of plywood, a pot of paint, and some assorted scenery. And lo and behold, the train doesn't get packed away after Christmas, but remains. But the problem with taking a circle of track and putting it onto a piece of plywood is that you lose the tree and you lose your perspective and you can suddenly see the whole thing traveling in a circuit. And then the realism is lost. There aren't many places in the world where you can go and watch the entire train chase its tail in a circle. I mean, even at Disneyland, where it just circles the park all day long, you still have to see it at a station. It arrives, it's there, and then it goes away. So when you put the train on the board, then you have to think, well, how do I get that back? I know, I'll put a mountain in the middle of this loop, or a tunnel over one part of the track, or some buildings in the way, or we'll just use some of that Christmas money and buy a little more track, and then the train will have something to do. <clears throat> then you put in a spur, and next to that spur you put, oh, I don't know, some cattle. Lionel had some wonderful operating accessories. You push a button, and the little cattle vibrate into the cattle car, while most of the time they would vibrate and fall over, and you'd have to shove them into the cattle car. Same thing with the milk cans. You push the button, and the milk cans go, and fall over. Oh, you would, at least the train has some work to do. Now the train arrives, does some business, and leaves. Even if you can still see it go around, you've added to the realism factor. Well, the trains get put away, the kids go to school, and years later you rediscover the hobby. This is a common litany these days. And you stumble into a train store or you happen across some publication, and you realize the trains have gotten smaller and more realistic than those old metal trains you had. And so you shell out for some of these newer trains, and you quickly realize setting up the circle on the plywood isn't going to do it anymore, and you start looking through magazines and find out that the trend is towards realism. Realism in the way you operate your train. And that is, you don't just stand in one spot and move the lever and watch it go. No, you have a digital control device. These days you can actually get an app for your smartphone to control your train. Can you believe it? And so you now can walk along with your train. And so the train goes over here, and you can do something here, and then the train goes over here, and you can do something here, and then the train goes through the wall into the next room, and you can do something there. You follow the train along. You're no longer the observer on the station platform. Now you're the engineer, the conductor, the brakeman, whoever you want to be, traveling with the train doing work as it does the work. Your perspective has changed. This is the perspectives at work in our gospel today. Didn't you see that when you read it? You immediately think trains? 
an insight into how your pastor's brain has worked. Here's John the Baptist standing on the station platform. And he sees Jesus coming. Here comes Jesus. And John says, here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And describes him a little bit. And then Jesus goes away. And the next day, down in verse 35, John again was standing on the station platform with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, Jesus making another loop around the tree here, he exclaimed, look, here's the Lamb of God, right on time, 10.02. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. The Jesus train stopped, they got on board, and they rode along with him. Now our perspective changes. We're no longer on the platform with John. Now we're walking along with our train, with Jesus. And we're in on this conversation he has with John's disciples. What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher. Where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. That's the call to make the shift from observer of the action to participant, from one who stands on the platform and watches to one who gets on the train and rides, the one who walks along with the model and does the work as realistic as possible. It's a part of the new trend in the hobby is to emulate the realism of things. Can you believe? Tiny, tiny, tiny little air hoses. Oh, I couldn't believe it when I saw this. You know, it's not enough that the car is coupled together. But in, the, in real life, the cars come and couple together, and if the brakeman is within visual distance of the engineer, he'll make a sign like this, which means I'm going to go between the cars, and the engineer might blow a single blast on the horn or the whistle. The brakeman goes in between the cars, reaches down, and grabs these two big air hoses, and they have special little hooks on each end. When you lift them up, they fit together, and when you drop them, they stay. So as the train pulls apart, once the knuckles are undone, the air hoses lift and they come apart. If you've ever watched a train uncouple, you hear a pop kind of sound. That's the air hoses coming apart. So the brakeman goes in, hooks up the air, walks out, usually makes a sign like this, and that's what it says pump it up, check the air, make sure everything works. There's other steps involved, but I won't bore you with the details. There's an action that's taking place right there. And so how do you reproduce that on, in miniature? Well, you put tiny little magnets on the ends of tiny little pieces of plastic, or little bitty pieces of rubber. And so when your little bitty couplers go together, there are these little rubber things go click, clip together. Now when you watch the train go by, you see these little air hoses hooked up. I'm thinking, what's next? Actual air? I mean, tiny little cylinders? Who knows? You can miniaturize things down so far to make that experience as realistic as possible. For a long time now, we've had smells. I don't know how, why people don't use more of this. Smell is so much more evocative than sound for many people. You can buy a little block, a little jar of special oil that's been scented, and you hide that little block in the bushes on your train layout or in a, in a building, and you put a few drops of that smell. Okay? You won't believe some of these smells. Um, rotting fish, creosote, that's the stuff that's used to treat the ties, or used to be used. If you've ever been there near the train tracks, you've smelled it. All right, creosote on the ties, coal smoke, burning oil, burning tires. I mean, really wonderful stuff that you want to, you, know, you can see why it hasn't caught on, right? But you can. Let's say you've got a pickle factory on your layout. You can put a block in there and put some pickle juice smell in there. And whenever you're switching out that, you can, gosh, that smells like pickles. It enhances the illusion of realism. But there's the difference. With model trains, it's an illusion. When you're done, you turn off the power and turn off the lights and go make dinner and do whatever else you do. You can go back in and turn on the lights and there you are and make it work again. You can step into the illusion through the action, the sights, the sounds, the smells. But it's just an illusion. With Jesus... It's not. It's real. When we see Jesus come by and go by again at the station, well, that's, that's real too. But many people watch Christianity at work. 
perhaps you were once in such a position where you saw other Christians doing Christian things or church things. You saw other believers doing strange rituals, drinking wine and eating little pieces of bread. What the heck is that all about, right? You see Christian faith at work through charity, good works, service, community work, but you're an observer. And then at some point, you make the step of faith, and you join in. And the illusion of reality becomes reality. You become a participant, not just an observer, one who wonders about such things, but one who does them. The disciples were beginning their journey with Jesus in this passage. They're stepping out of the observer's role into the participant's role. Can you think of a time in your Christian faith when you stopped being an observer and began to be a participant? And we have our, where's my green card? Here it is. We have our six marks of discipleship right here. And these are six ways to participate, to no longer be an observer, but to be part of that Jesus train that's rolling. Is it any wonder that people have written songs about that over the years? Let's look closely at these disciples. They came and saw where Jesus was staying, and they remained with him that day. And we can get the detail. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We found the Messiah. So we can see when they make the step from being an observer to being a participant, their level of commitment goes up. Their level of excitement goes up. Their level of energy goes up. Each year I take part in a wonderful operations day in Olympia. It's called OLEOPS. And it's a group of uh, folks who have large train layouts in their homes, large enough to support multiple operators. Multiple operators that have to wear headsets and call the dispatcher, carry paperwork, and make sure trains are in the right spots. I mean, it's a really a high-tech operation. And each year I go and do this, I spend the whole day, I spend the morning at one layout, and the afternoon at another. I find a nice place to eat in Olympia and have myself a lunch. And Christy watches the kids, I don't have to worry about a thing in that regard. I can just go and sort of experience this. And the admission fee is a can of food for their local food pantry in Olympia. How about that? But more than that, I come home from that experience jazzed and ready to do something with my own trains. Although I'm worn out from standing on my feet all day and and being so focused on these tiny little things, the next morning I'm ready to go at it, sitting there working on a model, doing something. When we participate, our excitement goes up. When we are personally involved, personally committed, our level of commitment goes up. Our level of involvement can increase. Even if it's a small thing, we can still get some of that feeling that motivates us to continue on and to get more involved. It's a progressive curve. I've watched it happen with model trains as well, where you realize, you know, that gosh, these freight cars look too clean. I stand at the tracks and I see real freight cars go go by and they look so dirty. And so you bravely get some thinned paint and you take that car that you spent money on and you dip the brush in the paint and you start weathering it, making it look old and used. And then you look at it and you think, hey, that's not so bad. So you do another, and you do another, and pretty long before long, you're looking at a train set that looks more realistic, and it's exciting. Even a small step can take you deeper into what you're seeking to achieve. And so there's six of these on our card here that I can't seem to pick up. There we go. Just trim the fingernails, that's why. Pray daily. It's a small habit. But praying every day, getting into that small habit, can unlock other habits. The habit book that I just finished talked about keystone habits. One habit that seems to unlock all the others. For many people, that habit is getting up early in the morning or getting a good night's sleep, 
For some people, the habit is walking, just walking. Uh, and then five years later, they're running a marathon. Right? You get the idea. You get one small step, it unlocks a whole world of other steps. This first step that the disciples took was, was an interesting one. It's not one that many, um, I think, Christians would want to take. It just depends on your giftedness, I suppose. Right away, they did the evangelism piece, okay? <laughs> you might think, well, I'll do a Bible study, or I'll, I'll spend some prayer time, or I'll, I'll make a commitment to worship more regularly. Um, not, I'm going to go out and tell someone about Jesus right away, but that's the kind of fervor sometimes you get. When you take a small step of faith, they follow Jesus. They said, where are you going? Jesus said, come and see. And the next thing they did was they began to spread the news. I think Jesus knew what he was doing when he found himself uh, in the company of Andrew and then Simon. So he first found his brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah. He brought, which is exciting news. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you're Simon, son of John. You were to be called Cephas. And thus launched the, the Cephas Club, and that's a sermon for a whole other time. No, at that point, Jesus changed Simon's name. Well, gave him a nickname, depending on how you look at it. When you get involved in a different way, you take on that persona. You go from the point of being an observer to being a participant, to being someone who can call yourself Christian. From the observer's standpoint, you couldn't do that. And from the participant's standpoint, you may not be ready to do that. Well, come, get involved, try things out. And then, when you're ready to commit, then you get a name change. That's why baptism in many traditions is just an entry into the, into the church community. If you've ever been to a church where, uh, after you've been there for a while, they encourage you to be baptized, uh, many times that's so that you're making a public declaration that you are serving Christ in that particular faith community. You know, that's what baptism means for other, some other traditions. Here we have a, a ceremony of membership, of joining the church. It stands uh, in a very similar way almost identical because the phrasing we use for baptism is the same phrasing we use for joining the church. It's only without the water. When are you ready to commit to call yourself Christian and to declare it to others? For many model rarities, well, it's the time when you get that train hat that someone gives you and you're not ashamed to wear it in public. And then you go to a train show and you start getting pins and buttons and putting them on there and goofy train shirts that embarrass your wife when you wear them in the store. Yeah, that's when you're ready to make that step. Every group, every commitment has its symbol of commitment, its sign of declaration. Here we get a little glimpse of one. And Jesus says, you're Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas. It's translated as Peter. Well, Cephas also means rock, and later on we'll find out what that rock means for Peter. But for now, it's enough that his name was changed. Is your name changed? Are you Christian? Are you disciple? Are you follower of Jesus? Has your level of commitment reached that point where you're not ashamed to share that with the rest of the world? Even that itself can be a witness. I know sometimes in places of business, you're not really supposed to talk about your faith. But sometimes just wearing a cross on a necklace can be enough. Maybe sometimes wearing a little pin or you know, setting your Bible on your desk. There are different things you can do to publicly witness that you have made the step from observer to participant to committed believer. One who's not just ready to follow Jesus, but to go find others and say, hey, Come follow Jesus with me. It's an amazing journey for modelers, and maybe it's a journey of realism that enhances the fun of the hobby. But for Christians, it's a journey of faith that deepens our walk with Christ, calls us. That's why it says on the other side, we are called to be disciples. 
calls us, just as Jesus does, to come and see, to walk with him, to be a disciple.